everybody. I am Jessica Henry, Development Manager here at the Champaign Aviation Museum. And I'd like to thank the museum by clicking the link in the video description down below. You'll be supporting our mission and you'll get a lot of great benefits. Our speaker today, Jack Meacham, entered the Aviation Cadet Pilot Training Program in February of 1954. Upon graduation in May of 1955, he became an instructor in B-25 pilot training. He has logged more than 3,000 hours in B-25s. During his career in the United States Air Force, he flew more than 20 different types of military aircraft, including cargo, passenger, fighter, rotary, rotary wing, bomber, utility, and reconnaissance. He logged more than 12,100 flying hours during his 20-year career. Jack earned his BSME and completed his master's course at Texas Tech under the AFIT program. He spent more than six years in research and development at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base as a program manager in reconnaissance and at Systems Command Headquarters in the development and planning of future R&D programs. In 1966 through 1967, he planned and flew heavy helicopter missions in support of CIA operations in Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and North Vietnam. Upon retirement from the United States Air Force in 1974, Jack entered the aerospace business where he managed three aerospace firms, including the aerospace division of Chrysler, based in Dayton. He retired from the aerospace business in 1966. Please join me in welcoming Jack Meacham and the Black Mariah story. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, while we have this uh, image of the aircraft up here, I'd like to bring out a few features. First of all, in front of the engines, we had a shield. We were the only ones that had those. And the purpose of that was to keep any foreign objects from getting into the intakes of the engines because we operated at ground level a lot in, uh, in the jungles. The aircraft is amphibious. There's a hull underneath, and even though the contrast is hard to see, here what looks like a stubby wing is really a sponson for stability in the water. The ramp in the back would allow us to normally put two Jeeps inside or 35 combat ready troops in web seats along the sides. And if you look at the um, marine version they did not have the ramp and it was rounded in the back that is the same as the presidential helicopter marine one back here in the rear section of the fuselage we had a uh, position where you could put metal flags of the countries we carried the flags of the, all the surrounding countries and our orders were that if we went down in the country and had to abandon the aircraft, we were to put the appropriate flags on this, each side of the aircraft and destroy the others so that it couldn't be used for propaganda. All aircraft were unmarked because of our mission. There were no physical markings on the aircraft. The other uh, five aircraft were camouflage painted uh, and, and the same configuration. Oh, one thing I do want to go into, people think Jack, that those I apologize. blades... Can we pause for just one second? I don't know what caused... Do you have the phone? Yeah. Okay, come on down. Okay, we're back. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Here, here. <laughs> they do, don't they? <laughs> How you doing, Jack? It's fine. Good, good. good. We're good, now. good now. Most people think that the blades on those helicopters are very fragile. That's not true. This is a cross section of a blade. It's only four inches in width out of a 30 foot long blade. But 
The leading edge is wrapped in stainless steel to keep from abrading. And the steel rod that is in the front here goes through the entire outer third of the blade. And it's is pressurized with nitrogen to make it stronger. And the trailing edge, you can see the gussets are closer as you get into the outer third. There's about half as many more gussets to make it strong. So these were not fragile. And you'll see as I get into the briefing further why I brought that up. I have this ready, Jack. Let me know. These computers here. There we go. It was just frozen. There we go. Okay, I, during the briefing, I'll cover a little bit of my military background to give you uh, some insight as to how this transitioned. Uh, what went into the transition training to helicopters, because I had never flown a helicopter, never ridden in one. The organization of the 20th Helicopter Squadron, which was our, or, our organization over in Vietnam. Our mission objective, we had one and one only, and I'll go into that. I'll give you an overview of the aircraft itself so you can get a little better understanding of it. The types of missions we flew, what went into mission planning. Ours was different than everyone else's over there. Uh, what we used for fighter escort, and uh, and I'll give a few mission examples uh, that I flew that are representative of what we all flew. But I'm I'm more uh, up on those ones that I flew, and then I'll explain the significance of the Black Mariah itself, because as I mentioned, it was only one of six aircraft; the others were camouflaged. My military background, uh, you can see here, during pilot training, I flew the PA-18, the T-6, the T-28, and eventually the B-25. And then I flew all of these other types that you see here before I got the assignment one day and uh, I came back from lunch here at Wright-Patterson to fly helicopters. And I had never ridden in a helicopter. So I questioned it with the Pentagon. And they said, don't knock it. It's a plush assignment hall and VIPs. And I said, well, why do I need a top secret clearance? He said, well, that's just routine. Well, when I finished survival school, I had to take 200 hours of martial arts training, one-on-one -on -one with the expert in uh, 60 days. And I knew I didn't need that to haul VIPs. So you can see I had more than 8,000 flying hours in fixed wing and two years of reconnaissance strike and EW in uh, research and development. And I had the top secret clearance. I think in retrospect, the reason I got that assignment was during my time at Wright Pad and R&D, I did a lot of work with the CIA. And so they got to know me, trusted me. At uh, the transition training took place at Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas. And most of our work was done up at Fort Sill, which was just a short flight up the uh, highway because they had all the landing zones laid out. So we could go in and practice in those. It lasted for approximately 75 days and during that time, we spent 20 hours in the H-19. Well, the H-19 was a prop driven with the engine in the front and the cockpit above the cargo area. And it was a bear. Everything was manual. When uh, 
you didn't dare take your hands off of any of the controls because you didn't know what was going to happen if you did. And uh, if you had to scratch your nose, you told the instructor to take command of the aircraft because if you took your hand off that stick to scratch your nose, he's going to smack you across the back of the head. Now, it was totally different when we got into the H-3. The H-3 is a very stable aircraft. It has an automatic flight control system, which operates as an autopilot. So you can actually let the aircraft fly itself. But the, um, other than the hover, there is no difference really in the fixed wing or, or the uh, helicopter. Uh, the stick in the fixed wing controls the ailerons on the wing and the elevators on the tail. The stick in the helicopter controls the rotor uh, plane and tilts it in whatever direction you move the stick. So it does the same functions. The um, pedals on the floor control the rudder on an aircraft, conventional aircraft. On a helicopter, they control the pitch on the blade of the tail rotor, which accomplishes the same thing. Um, the reason you need that is because of the momentum of the blades. If you're in a hover uh, with no wind coming across the tail, you're going to start turning the helicopter. So those are very similar. The collective, which is on the floor, when you pull that in, it does, it increases the pitch, but it also increases the throttle. So you're doing the same thing as a throttle itself. So it's very similar, like I said, except for the uh, hovering aspect of it. The, uh, to simulate Southeast Asia conditions, and the reason I say simulate that because the density altitudes were over there were very high and that limited our performance. So the instructor would have you lifted into a hover and he would put his hand over the collective so you had no more power available. Then you had to nose forward and get into translational lift at about 20 miles an hour. Um, and once you're in translational lift, you transition to a uh, forward flight. Uh, if you pull it into a hover of five feet, you're going to go back into the ground. If you pull it into a hover of one to two feet, you'll have no problem going forward. It's that critical. And that's what they were trying to get across to us in that training. When I took my final check ride, um, the flight commander gave it to me. It was on a Saturday. And uh, he and I played golf on, on weekends normally. And uh, he had closed the club the night before. So he didn't leave the club till about two o'clock in the morning. We were out there at eight o'clock flying the check ride. He told me prior to the flight what he wanted me to do and what sequence. And as I was taxiing out, he went to sleep. Well, I went through all of the things that he said, came back in, and as I was taxiing in, he woke up. And he said, how did we do? And I said, fantastic. <laughs> and that was my check. <laughs> this is a map of Southeast Asia, and I want to put things into perspective. You can see North Vietnam, South Vietnam, the DMZ, uh, Laos, all the way down to here, Cambodia, and Thailand. And um, what you're seeing with this orange here, that's the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now, initially, when the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down before we were over there in force, it came down actually through Vietnam. But once we got forces over there, that wasn't feasible any longer. So they moved it into Laos, which was a neutral country. And that's how they supplied their troops. Most of it came in at the Megia Pass. Down in the southern section here, there was a branch that came across and joined in with the Mekong, Mekong River, where they would take things down into the Delta, their supplies. And I want to bring out at this point, right in this area here, was the Bolivan Plateau. And I'll get into that in just a minute. 
what the significance of that was. Initially, 14 aircraft were disassembled over here, taken over to South Vietnam, reassembled, and four of those were put at Saigon, to, and four at uh, Cameron Bay, and four at Da Nang. And the purpose of those 12 was to support the Army and the Marine Corps with heavy lift capability. The other two were put at Nakam Phnom in Thailand, and uh, their purpose was to be the first long-range rescue aircraft, because rescue didn't have theirs configured yet. And with the aerial refueling and, and uh, all the armor plating and the drop tanks. So they served that purpose for approximately one year. The Black Mariah was one of those. And those two aircraft, the crews of those two, were the ones that coined the term Jolly Green Giant. Now, when Je uh, Rescue came over with their aircraft, and they were uh, stationed at various places, the, those two that were here and the four that were at Cameron Bay uh, came over to Udorn and became our outfit. And the reason for being at Udorn, that was where CIA headquarters was. So that facilitated. Now, we could not be in Thailand permanent change of station for political reasons. So we were assigned to Nha Trang Air Base and uh, right here under the 14th Air Commando Wing and TDY, temporary duty, to Udorn, which is fine because we got extra pay that way. But that satisfied the political aspects of it. Now, the commander at... Uh, at uh, down here at Natrang, even though we were under him on paper, he had no idea what we were doing. And he had no need to know. So it was kind of an unusual situation. Um, it was all a paper thing. And we got, a, I didn't know until I got actually in place over there that I was going to be flying for the CIA and that I was in charge of the operation. It was held that tightly. And our mission was to support the CIA and the secret war in Laos. Now, we went beyond Laos, but that was our primary uh, along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The areas of operation though included Laos, North Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. I just want to show you that you know, people consider Vietnam as being a, uh, a wasteland. This is the train. And the base is behind the beach here, right across the road. The village is over in here. And this was known as the Riviera of South Vietnam. So it really wasn't a wasteland, you know. This is on the Bullivan Plateau that I mentioned earlier. And you can see that all of those structures are on stilts. The reason for that was the monsoons. When the monsoons came, uh, there was water on the ground all the time. So that's why they were all up. And this, by the way, the Bullivan Plateau at that time was the richest coffee growing region in the world. This is uh, just north of, of Vinh Tien, which is the capital of Laos, southern Laos. Uh, this is the uh, Lima site, we called it, LS-20, uh, which was Air, where Air America was based. And that rock that you see here, that was right at the north end of the runway. And there was only a 3,000 foot strip. So fixed wing did not take off to the north or land to the south, but they were using porters, so it didn't take them very long to get off the ground. And 
This is one last photo here of the western edge of the Bullivan Plateau. That uh, waterfall that you see there is about a thousand feet in height. And you can see the jungle is pretty dense. A little overview of the aircraft itself. Uh, the six that we had, we upgraded the engines in the field to give them uh, more horsepower. We had 3,000 horsepower and they were GE engines. Uh, we removed all the non-essential equipment and sanitized the aircraft as much as possible so that if it uh, had to be abandoned, uh, it couldn't be used for propaganda. The rotor plane diameter was 62 feet. And if you think about that, that's probably about as long as most houses. So it was a pretty good sized rotor plane. We cruised at 200 miles an hour. Now the Jolly Green version with all the armor plating, the aerial refueling, the drop tanks, they were so heavy that they cruised about 50 miles an hour slower. We could not tolerate that weight. If we had full fuel on board in tanks in the belly, uh, we had a range of 800 miles. So we didn't need aerial refueling. They had to loiter, that's why they needed it. And uh, we never carried full fuel. We wanted to be as light as possible when we got into a landing zone. So what we would do, if we were going to North Vietnam, say we had a Lima Site 36, which was a beam Hanoi in the Eastern part of Laos. We would go up there put on the final fuel for the mission with a little reserve to get us back to that point. And that's all. So rarely, I, I don't remember ever having full fuel on board. Our call sign was Pony Express. Now that came out of, uh, that was a code word that was used when they first active, reactivated the 20th helicopter squadron. They used that as, uh, as the code word. So we carried that on as our call sign. Our problems due to high density altitudes, first of all, as I said before, it limited the payload. Um, we, you know, if we were operating at, a, at uh, sea level, it was almost over there like operating about 5,000 feet because of the density altitudes. So it was really severe compared to over here. Height of the trees, in south, uh, southern Laos, the trees, the biggest ones you'd encounter would be maybe 100 feet in height. You got into north, northern Laos, uh, I've encountered trees as high as 200 feet. And north of Hanoi, at one time, I encountered trees at 300 feet in height. So, you know, you're getting way up there. And if you're operating in those, you've got to be able to get back out of there. And then the landing side, landing zone size was very small. The CIA would designate the landing zone. And we could see it in three-dimensional photography. Uh, but, you know, they were still very small because they didn't want the enemy to be looking for us. So they would pick something that was virtually out in nowhere. And uh, because of that, we many times would have to chop our way through the trees coming out of the landing zones. And of course, we'd use the blades and that'll protect the helicopter itself. And that's why I went into the, the uh, definition of those blades, because it was critical. I have chopped down a tree a foot in diameter and did no damage to the blade. Wow. So, <laughs> you know, the, the speed, of, the, the tip of the blade is turning at the speed of sound. So it's a big knife out there. Mm -hmm. The missions we flew, norm normally we, we would infiltrate uh, indigenous teams, that's native teams or individuals into a landing zone near the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They would either dig in and report movements of the enemy or they would actually infiltrate the enemy, move with them and report on their progress. And that would give us targets of opportunity. 
Um, exfiltration of the same is required when they finish their mission. Exfiltration of long-term spies from North Vietnam. Uh, I flew the, the first mission that ever went up there. And we had an interpreter on board that had grown up with them. So he knew them intimately. And they had parachute panels to lay out in a, in a pattern so that we could identify that it was them. And we went up there, they laid out the parachute panels, we landed, the, uh, they got, two of them came and they got about 50 feet from the aircraft and the uh, interpreter mowed them down with the 50 caliber in the door. And he said, get the hell out of here, it's not them. And, uh, you know, we took a couple of hits, but nothing significant getting out of there. But if it hadn't been for him, we'd have had them on board. And so they decided that those long-term spies like that, it just wasn't feasible. So we, we didn't do any more of those type of missions. Emergency exfiltrations is required. Sometimes the team would be uh, spotted by the enemy and they'd be on the run with the enemy chasing them. And we had to go in and get them out of there. And, uh, I'll, I'll cover one such mission uh, as we get further down. Support for construction and maintenance of Lima Site 85. Oops. Lima Site 85, this is a depiction of it. The normal, uh, this is at 5,600 feet. The normal uh, helicopter landing zone is over here. This is where they wanted to put the equipment. At the time when we did it, this structure was not there. If we took the equipment into here, they had no way to get it around to where they needed to set up. What they were doing was setting up a uh, very high resolution bomb scoring radar to use to direct strikes against targets of opportunity in Hanoi under all weather conditions. I used that bomb scoring radar over here and at 35 miles the accuracy was 8 feet. So at, at 100 miles there, I, I don't know what it was, but it's pretty accurate. And the, the actual Lima Site 85 was at the foot of the mountain. The 130 would bring the equipment in, land there, and we would take it up to the top of the mountain. And when you got to about 100 feet above that site, we would land right there. You got to about 100 feet above that site, uh, you better have the proper landing zone in, in uh, mind because you're gonna land someplace. We had no alternative. And for that reason, only two of us, two helicopters, did the mission completely which took uh, a few days. Once we were on the ground here and offloaded, uh, sometimes we would have to bring equipment back down to the Lima Site 85. And of course we could not hover with that load on board. And you can't run off of the end because you're probably gonna get the tail rope. So what we would do is hover empty up on here. And that's about the size of the helicopter. And we get the, the right main gear as close to the edge as possible. Load the equipment on, lash it down, pull in full power, roll off the side of the mountain and recover on the way down. And uh, it had to be fun. <laughs> this is what it looked like from the side. That's where we were. And by the way, about a year later, after I left, uh, this site was overrun by the enemy. Now, all of the paths going up there were guarded. The enemy actually came up this one. They came up the sheer cliff and overran the facility. We also did uh, support for the Thai government. And one of the things we did in, in eastern northeastern Thailand, they were having a problem with communist terrorists at times. So they wanted to put radios in the villages so that they could call and warn the government. 
and the government could do something about it. Well, in most of those cases, the natives had never seen an American, and a lot of them had never seen a helicopter. So we had to be very careful going in there. First of all, we didn't want to land too close because you would take the roofs off of their structures with the downwash from the helicopter. So we had to be careful with that. Secondly, when we went into the village to put the radios in, we did not use weapons, um, didn't carry them. That way, you know, it wouldn't get those people on an uneasy status. And when we'd land, you wouldn't see a, a soul. And pretty soon, people would start looking around the structures at you. And then they'd start walking out toward the helicopter. Well, after the first one of those, I found, uh, I, I went to the base exchange, and I got a bunch of wrapped candy. And when they'd come out, I'd give it to the kids. And that broke the ice. So from then on, we were buddies. <laughs> Communist uh, terrorist containment, they had a, um, in north northeastern uh, Thailand, uh, they had a bunch of communist terrorists in one area. And the two-star general that I worked with there, Thai general, he wanted to do something about it, but he wasn't sure how to do it. So he asked me if, if I would plan that mission and fly it. So I planned it. We got our six aircraft and uh, some of their uh, H-34s, and we loaded them with troops, Thai troops. And I led, and we surrounded the area out of sight and out of sound of the uh, terrorists. And then once we had it surrounded, we came in toward the center and landed, and the troops offloaded and went in and wiped them out. Well, that night I was planning missions for the next day. And I got a call on the secure line from a two-star general in Saigon. He chewed me up one side and down the other for invading Thailand. And uh, he said, from now on, I'll plan your missions. And of course, I knew he had no idea who we were. He had no way of knowing. So I didn't get snotty or anything, you know. When I hung up, I had a number to call if I had outside interference, and it was directly to the State Department. So I called them and told them what had happened because we couldn't tolerate them doing our planning. And uh, about a half hour later, the general called back. He said, uh, I apologize. I didn't know who you were. Forget everything I said. And I found out later he got chewed out. <laughs> but you know, it was a different type of operation that we were involved in. And then others as required. There were some that were fun. Um, that two-star general, I took him to a um, war games in Thailand. And uh, he wanted us to stay with him instead of going home and coming back, picking him up. And it was um, close to the Mekong River. So... We went to the war games and we sat on the on the porch of this house and with towels, you know, to, that were wet, you know, and so we could keep cool and uh, drinks, you know, I mean, <laughs> it was really rough in it. <laughs> but but uh, and then we had uh, lunch afterwards along the Mekong River. And then we went to the temple. And he was telling us what they were doing in the temple. And he said, now they're gonna have you people come up. There were two of us, two pilots. So they're gonna have you come up and um, and they're going to, each one of them is gonna recognize you as a friend. And they're gonna tie a piece of string around your wrist. And sure enough, they did that. So I, I had, I think it was 36 strings and the general said, now, tonight when you go into town in Udorn, do not take that off and tell me what happens. We went into town that night and people were falling on our feet like we were royalty. <laughs> you know, they recognized that. <laughs> I said, I told the general, I said, I'm going to keep that on all the time. <laughs> 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 and 
and uh, night emergency medical evacuation. They, they were having some problems. The roads were really bad over there. And it would take them forever to get to the hospitals. So I, myself, set up this medical evacuation and uh, didn't ask anybody, didn't get approval for it, just did it. And I had uh, an aircraft sitting cocked, ready to go. All they had to do was start the engines and go and the crew on standby. And it was for ties, not for us. And we'd go out to, oh, maybe 60, 70 miles from the base. And the first one I had, this 12-year-old girl had fallen on a stake in the ground and it went completely through her chest. Fortunately, they didn't try to extract it. They cut it off at the ground left the stake in there. It took us about, uh, oh, maybe 10 minutes to get out there. And it would have taken them two hours to get to the hospital. It took us five minutes. And got to the hospital, the doctor met us at the door, started working on her, and uh, called a couple of days later and told me that uh, she was gonna be fine. He said 15 minutes longer, she would have been dead. So there was a lot of satisfaction in, you know, having that set up like that because we ended up saving quite a few lives that way. And then rescue is required. When we would do a mission, a lot of times we would use the strikes as diversion. And one of the uh, strike pilots would get shot down or crews. And if it was in the area we were operating in, when we finished our mission, we would go in and pull them out because we were there, we could be in there before the enemy had a chance to do anything. And we had A1s with us, so they could locate the, from the beeper where those down people were. And if one of them would make a run, and if he said, let's do it, we'd go in and pull them out. Now, when we got back to the base, we had to land at the perimeter of the field Jolly Green Giant would taxi out and put the rescued people on there. and They would taxi in. The reason for that was the press met. And they didn't want us exposed with no markings on the aircraft and no insignia on us. And we parked our aircraft among the Jolly Green Giants so they wouldn't be conspicuous sitting by themselves. Mission planning was done at the 713th Air Force Headquarters. 713th was in charge of all operations for the Air Force in Southeast Asia. General Bond was the commander there. And he informed me in, uh, when I first came on board that um, we had the highest uh, Uh, top secret in the area. Our mission was the highest top secret. And he said that uh, even he did not have a need to know. And he had no authority over us. So I really was my own boss, which you can get things done that way. But um, of course you're accountable, but still uh, that didn't bother me. I was the single point of contact with the CIA. Dick Secord was my point of contact. Later, he was the Iran Contra General. And he would come to me with his requirements and I could ask him any questions. They would be in writing, top secret. And once he left, I had no way to contact him. So, you know, I would better get everything answered before he left. And then it was up to me to plan and execute the missions. He had no knowledge of how we did it. And uh, to this day, even the Air Force has none of this history, even though it's been declassified now. Our, our, our normal frag, fragmentation order as they call it, would uh, give the target coordinates, the time over target, and any other pertinent data for the forces that were going to be doing that. 
ours, we, I gave the time and coordinates for the fighter escort to rendezvous. They had no idea where they were going. They only knew where to rendezvous. I told them how much fuel and armament requirements. So um, they were just following us. And then prior to departure, when I briefed other crews, or even, we always went in pairs. Um, if, if it required one helicopter to do the mission, we would have a, a backup. If it required two helicopters, we would still have a backup. And uh, the fighters, there were always two of those. So uh, when I briefed people on a mission, uh, they would have to immediately depart on the mission so that nothing inadvertently slipped out. And the crew chiefs weren't even supposed to know where they were going. Well, we never went back to the same landing zone. So once we got en route, I would always brief the crew chief because if we go down, he's got to have some idea where he is to try to survive. And uh, you know, I, I just figured that was the only way to really do things. Now, there were some times when there were sensitive requirements that were given to me by the CIA that I couldn't even disclose to the pilots flying the mission. And uh, one of them was for a period of three weeks, all missions near the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the, we were only on the ground normally a, a couple of seconds, just long enough for that team of two to six to jump out of the aircraft. Or for that period, the crew chief had to exit the aircraft, take photos in four cardinal directions, and dig a pail of dirt. Sometimes it'd be under fire, and of course they were irate with me, because I couldn't tell them why. Well, what had happened was a company in the States had developed a chemical when it was put on the trail, and uh, the clouds were seeded to cause rain. They turned the trail into a quagmire. And, you know, that was too sensitive to let people know because then the enemy would be looking for ways to circumvent that. And then telephone priorities. Uh, there was routine, priority, uh, immediate, general officer immediate, flash and flash override. I used immediate normally. I was authorized to use any priority I needed to get the mission done. Normally I used immediate. Uh, sometimes I would be preempted by a general officer immediate, so I would have to go to flash. And on three occasions, I had to use flash override for emergencies, and that is reserved for the president. Of course, he's not over there, but um, I was authorized to use that. So, <clears throat> fighter escort, normal missions, we used A1s. A1E was a fantastic aircraft for close air support. They could stay right there with you, roll in. They could take a lot of hits. Uh, they had eight hours of fuel on board. They just, they were fantastic. Uh, one time I had to use T-28s um, that were flown by Air America. And it turned out uh, they had to go home, but I'll get into that when I talk about the mission. Emergency exfiltrations. Normally the A1s were spoken for. So we would end up with F4s or F105s. Well, they're just too fast. And in most cases, um, they would be calling bingo on fuel and we'd just send them home and we'd do our own protection. We carried uh, our own, own weapons on board. And sometimes we had a 50 caliber in the door and we always carried a portable grenade launcher. So that's what we had if we had to take that on. And if you wanted to strike along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, you had to get prior approval from Ambassador Sullivan in Laos. Uh, many times, by the time you got that approval, the targets were gone. We were the only outfit in Southeast Asia 
that had blanket authority to direct strikes against targets of opportunity on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So when the A1s came back from a mission, if they hadn't expended their munitions, they knew they were going to have some fun because we turned <laughs> loose on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I want to go into just a few missions, like I said, that I flew, but these are representative of what we all flew. First one was the evacuation of village in Laos under siege, and we all did that. That was in this general area here, and um, I told the crew chief when we got in there, let 35 of them on board because they brought personal belongings with them. And the next thing I turned around, the whole back end was full of people. And he, he came up, crew chief came up and said, I, I couldn't stop them. Well, I can understand, you know, they wanted to survive. So I said, well, close the ramp so they don't fall out. They were all standing up. And when we got back to the base and offloaded, in addition to the crew of three, we had 78 of them. So we had 81 of us on board. <laughs> they couldn't have fallen over if they wanted to. <laughs> uh, infiltration on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, one of the missions I flew there, the landing zone that was designated that I saw with three-dimensional photography, at the time I said, that's too small, you know, to even get into. Well, we got out there and sure enough, it was too small. There was no activity on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So I landed on the trail and we're only there a couple seconds to let that team off. Team got off and, and there was brush right there close so they were they were gone well i turned to take off there was a road repair team or gang coming around the bend and there's about 300 of them and each each one would have a show and that's how they repaired bomb craters well i wasn't worried about them but they had guards with them and the guards were around the outside I knew if I tried to lift into a hover or turn around and go out the other way, they're going to start shooting at us. So what I did was put in, pulled in full power and headed right at them, about a foot off the ground. And I was doing 200 when I got to them. And of course, they were bailing out to the sides. And they rendered the guards worthless because they just overran them. So we got out of there without a hit. But... Um, you just had to use some creativity. Then emergency exfiltration in Southern Laos. That's one where the team was on the run. The enemy was chasing them. Uh, we had F-105s for escort. And I told them we rendezvoused. They saw us. We saw them. And uh, I said, in 10 minutes, we're going to turn south. And... As we approached it, I said, have you still got us in sight? And they said, yeah, you're down there by the river. Well, there wasn't any river. And I said, where are you? They were in the center of South Vietnam. We were in the center of Laos. And they were having a fuel problem. So I said, go home. So we, we turned and went down there and we found them. And the enemy was chasing them. So now we have no fighter escort. So the other helicopter tried to get them to a uh, landing zone where we could pick them up. And in the meantime, I flew between them and the enemy. And uh, the co-pilot and the crew chief sat in the door firing at them to try to slow them down. And we finally got them into the uh, an appropriate landing zone. And then the other helicopter with me uh, had a uh, mechanical problem. So I went in and pulled them out. And uh, coming out of there, I had to chop my way through the trees. And that's one where I took out a tree about a foot in diameter. But it did no damage. And uh, emergency exfiltration in the Mejia Pass. Uh, as I mentioned before, that's up here. And you know, politically, we could have rendered those people useless. 
they had a hundred millimeter radar guided uh, gun in that pass, and we were not allowed to take that out politically. But the um, team that had been in there, they were on the run, and it was a box canyon out to the west of it. And that's when we had T-28s for escort. We got up there, the Box Canyon was uh, shrouded in clouds. So the T-28s, we just sent them home because we had to come up, put the nose up against the, the side of the canyon, climb up through the clouds, keeping that in sight. We got to the top, turn around and back down the other side keeping that in sight. And the crew chief got on the ramp in the back to make sure that there was nothing hard behind us as we were backing down. We got below the clouds and we finally found the uh, team. And the jungle was very dense there. So we used the hoist. Well, it wasn't long enough to reach them. So what I had to do was get between two trees and the trees were close and then chop my way down through the trees until I got to where they could get the cable. And we brought them up on a uh, retriever. And just before I got the last ones up, the other helicopter called and said, we got to get the hell out of here because we're in the clouds. So now with a hundred millimeter gun, you can't just climb rapidly. You've got to go out through that box canyon slowly climbing. So they were doing that in the clouds, hoping they didn't run into anything hard. And by the time I got the last ones on board, the clouds were below me in the tree. So I had to come up out of the trees and then do the same thing he did get out of there and uh, you, you you never know what's going to be ahead of you but that's the way you had to do it otherwise you're going to get shot down and then the rescue in North Vietnam I did one mission up there north of Hanoi and I was headed back and the strikes were going on and the uh, one of the uh, 105s got shot down. The wingman called rescue control and said, I've got a good shoot on him. Need to send rescue up there to get him. Well, rescue couldn't go north of Hanoi because of the loiter time. Sometimes rescue control would hold him back for a couple of hours and it would become a hotbed. So it just wasn't feasible for them to go up there. Well, about three minutes after he called them, I saw his parachute floating down. So I called the wingman. I said, I've got him in sight. I'll bring him in. Rescue control said, who are you? I said, if you don't recognize the call sign, you don't have a need to know. <laughs> and um, they said, well, you're not authorized to pick him up. I said, I don't need your authorization. I said, I'd appreciate it if you clear the air and let me work the problem. And uh, I stayed back over the jungle so that the enemy couldn't see me or hear me. And when I saw where he was going to land, and it was right at the outskirts of Hanoi, I popped into the field. It was a big field. And I was on the ground about two seconds before he was. He shed his chute, dove on board, and that was in the Black Mariah. And I immediately went to full power, <clears throat> stayed about a foot off the ground. And when I got to the tree line, I was doing 200. And I pulled up over the tree line. This was one o'clock in the afternoon. I could see a sheet of bullets. And it turned out they were, they were ZPUs, quads, and they were putting out 12,000 rounds a minute. And that's why I could see something. So I made a break to the right and we took over 60 hits. Uh, no one on board got hit. We, and a lot of structural damage. And uh, one of them came up between my legs and creased my helmet, but you know, nobody got hit. And we were able to get back to that 
Lima site in, in Laos and leave the aircraft there. And I thought, when I came back and riding in the other helicopter, I thought, you know, it's, it's all going to dawn on me now. I slept all the way back. <laughs> Oh, it's just a wiggle on your uh, mouse keypad a little bit. Oh, wake it back up. And uh, so, you know, everything worked out. But that's another one. I got a call from a two-star general in Saigon, and the same thing happened. And, uh, of course, they, you know, they don't talk to each other, and, and uh, they didn't know who we were. Like I said, people can't know when you're doing those kind of things. If they do, you can't do it. So, you know, we observed that very closely. And, and the two, the general there at 713th headquarters, he was very aware of that. He never, he told me one day in his office, he said, he said, Jack, I, I'd ask you what you do, but I know you'd have to shoot me. <laughs> I said, you got that right. <laughs> the Black Mariah, the reason for being different. First of all, when it was in rescue, they needed to repaint it, and they ran out of camouflage paint, so they painted it black. Well, it got nicknamed the Black Mariah. When they got the camouflage paint back in, nobody would let them repaint it. So that's why it was black. You know, people conjecture that it flew night missions. No, we didn't fly any night missions. Especially in rescue, you couldn't. So that's what's behind it. It's nothing mystique. <laughs> it had a reputation among the enemy. By that, I mean it, it had a price tag on its head of $50,000. And at that time, a common laborer over there made 20 cents an hour. So $50,000 would be a lot of money if they shot down that aircraft. And then later on, uh, you remember when the MGM Grand burned in Vegas in the 80s? Uh, a lot of the people went to the roof. The Black Mariah, not black anymore, in rescue, just happened to be there at the base, and it pulled them off the roof. So, you know, it it has quite a reputation. And that aircraft is now in the museum here at Wright Patterson. So, if you uh, see it out there, you'll see one of the aircraft that I flew. That concludes the briefing. Have any questions? I just have a question. Did you ever insert or extract agency? Extract what? Uh, agency. That was AFA. Oh, no. The, uh, you said the, the blade was pressurized? Yes. With nitrogen. Yeah, if one of those units were hit and depressurized, would it show, throw the pitch off anyway? Well, it, it, it could um, cause a little bit of vibration. Um, you know, I, I, I never encountered that. And we had a what we called a BIM indicator up on the head of the blades. And it would tell us if there was any leaks in the blade on the pre-flight, uh -huh. and uh, I, I never never found one that had a leak. But as far as taking a hit, yes. And I did take, when I flew that uh, rescue in North Vietnam, um, one of the blades dropped about three feet below the others, and they found that uh, a round went through that blade and took out the counterweight. And so we had to cruise at about 120, and it was still very rough. There's no way we could cruise at 200. How did she go from Las Vegas to Ryan Pat? What happened in the, the interim there? Who? The, the Black Mariah. From Las oh. Vegas being out there with the... Well, well it, uh, it finished. It, it went into rescue after it left Southeast Asia. And it was stationed at Luke Air Force Base in Arizona. It was TDY up to Nellis at the time. But all of those have been retired since that time. And when it was retired, it was brought to Wright-Patterson to be in the museum. 
somebody just recognize what it was? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They try, the museum tries to get aircraft with some significance rather than just run of the mill. Is that bolt hole still in the airplane? Can you see it? I feel like I heard a story that you, the bolt hole still in the Well, you, deck. there's no bullet hole, but you can see patches. The patches were, yeah, that's what it looks yeah, like. Someone yeah. patched yes. it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? That concludes the briefing. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jack. That was great. It's more interesting every time I hear it. <laughs> I enjoy it. I enjoy it.